Hi, this is Joe Chambers. Welcome to Musicians Hall of Fame Backstage the Vault Series. This is another clip from Will Lee's interview we did back in 2004 in New York City. In this clip, Will talks about meeting Paul Schaefer and how they put together the world's most dangerous band in the beginning of a 30-year, every-night gig on the David Letterman show or the late-night show. Hope you enjoy it. If you do, be sure to hit like, subscribe, and the notification bell so you don't miss any of our new content. Again, Will Lee. It was back in 82, in like the winter of 82. <clears throat> um, Paul Schaefer and I, who had been really good friends since we first met, uh, we always got along really well. We did a lot of records together. We did a lot of sessions. We did some Cher records and some Barry Manilow records. We got to L.A. and do some records. We'd, you know, we record here in town. He produced a band that I had called the 24th Street Band. And uh, the the band members of of 24th Street were were uh, Steve Jordan on drums and uh, Clifford Carter on keyboards and Hiram Bullock on guitar and myself. And we had a really great following in New York City and Japan and stuff. Three albums out, and Paul had Schaefer had produced one of our records. He was really that close to us. You know, we were really tight. And um, the after the band broke up. Um, Paul had it had gotten a call from uh, from the producers, I guess, of the letter of the of the about to be Letterman show mm -hmm. called called Late Night with David Letterman, mm -hmm. um, and they said we want you to be the, the musical director for this this new comedy talk show pilot. And Paul came to me and he said, "I'd like to have the remaining guys, other than you know, since I'm the keyboard player, I'd like to have the other guys from the Twenty Fourth Street Band, you, the guitarist and the drummer." be this band on this talk show and I have an idea for the music to be instrumental James Brown, Beatles, and Motown. And that, at that time that had never been done before in a situation like this. And it was like a very innovative idea that Paul has and of course now that's what everybody does. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> I said, man, this is great. 13 weeks worth of work for a musician. That's a steady gig. This is a great thing for me. Yeah. In town. Yeah, I mm -hmm. said, when, did, when does it start? He said, next week. And I said, man, let's go learn some tunes, you know. Mm -hmm. So that night we went, got together and learned like Tears of a Clown and a few tunes. And a week later, we're, we're, we're taping the first Letterman pilot. And uh, with Tears of a Clown going to a go-go and all this other great stuff. And, uh, you know, 13 weeks worth of work was really something special to look forward to, you know. And I was really excited about it and so were the other guys. And next thing you knew, it got renewed for another 13 weeks. 13, hallelujah, another 13 <laughs> weeks worth of work, man. This is, we're floating, you know, on a cloud. This is incredible. And that was 24 years ago. 24 years worth of steady work for a musician is almost unheard of. You know, the Stones, maybe. Mm -hmm. And who knows where it's going to head. It, we, it may continue another... Five, six years, it could be some kind of world record. It would, I'm sure it would be impossible for it to ever happen again. It's such a crazy business. Did uh, being on that show, did that just make your studio work go through the roof by being in front of everybody every night? Well, not really because I was actually really established at that point and I was as busy as a person can be, you know, doing singing jingles and playing jingles and singing and playing record dates and doing any, any live stuff I could squeeze in at night, which was usually in town. I couldn't feasibly go on the road anymore at all. Mm -hmm. um, it took a very understanding producer to, to work on a project where he knew he'd have to take out this four-hour hole in the middle of the day and stop everything so I could go do the show. So it was really hard for me to, to stay involved as much in the record scene at the time. Mm -hmm. Back in, this is early 80s, you know, but I still did plenty of records. You know, a, a lot of guys were were cool, and a lot of guys would just do nights or just mornings. You know, but it, you know, it was rarely. It took a lot of understanding for a guy like Arif Martin to keep calling me, knowing that he had to take out that four hour break in the middle of the day and and stop the action. You know, imagine if things were really rolling well, and well, I got to go. Sorry. You know. Well, you know. You got to give yourself credit. I mean, there's there's a reason they did that. Yeah, know? but I mean, you know, the, the, everybody has a tolerance level, and I think 
most of those guys started running out of patience after a while and found, found there was a, a lot more efficient way to do things. You know, So at that point, I started getting called less and less by certain producers. You know, but still, I still do a, a lot of work, though. Mm. And a lot of stuff is done at home now, you know. Tell everybody a few of the records that you've played on and artists that you've played on in the studio, that you know, the, the top four, either jazz, whatever. Oh, man. Okay, well, let's see, I wish I had my discography in front of me because there's a lot. You know, I don't want to leave anybody out. But, you know, we could start with Carly Simon or The Spinners. There's a couple of the albums with The Spinners. Did some nice stuff with Dion Warwick. We did a song called Deja Vu that came out really right. nice. Or Isaac Hayes song. We used to cover that. that was yeah, great. that's a good one. Mm-hmm. And we did uh, recorded with Cher, two or three albums with Cher. You know, B.B. Snow, um, Cindy Lauper, Billy Joel. I recorded with uh, James Brown. Get up off of that thing. I used to play that. I love <laughs> that's that. That's a good song. That was a good song. Uh, you know, it's funny when you go in the studio and you you're a studio musician. A lot of times, you know, the worst of, of the worst is when a studio musician goes in and gets paid like 40 bucks an hour or something like that and just has chart after chart put in front of them and you just got to play them and you probably never hear from the producer again or if you do, it'll be to, you know, let's do another four hours of, of let me pay you $160 and let me, you know, let's get another 10 or 12 songs out mm-hmm. of you, you know. And then, you know, the song's a huge hit and people make millions and you make $40. You know? mm-hmm. And there's a lot of, there have been, a lot, in history, there have been a lot of, uh, a lot of kind of factories like that. Like in Miami, there was a whole scene where a lot of hit records were coming out. We were, you know, on the James Brown tune, we would get like charts put in front of us and they didn't even have titles yet. Number 19, you know. And, you know, you play this groove and, I didn't. Even, I wasn't aware that I played on "Get Up Off of That Thing" until Christopher Parker told me because he was on the session too. Mm-hmm. You know, and now that I hear it, oh yeah, that was number that was number fifty. That was number fifty-two <laughs> on the chart. That's what the chart said on it at the time. So you played bass on Mandy. Yeah, I, that was our first big hit with him. That's, that was really exciting. It's still a great song, great yeah. record. I mean, the record, you know, just great. We cut it as a trio. In fact, we had cut it a whole different way before. Before Clive Davis came in, we had cut it. Barry Manilow was a big fan of uh, of the Philly sound, and the Philly sound at the time was something like the Spinners doing "I'll Get Around," that kind of groove, where the where the backbeats were on the tom toms on two and four. It was like, and we cut it like, "I remember all my life, raining down as cold as ice." We were very happy with our version of Mandy that we had just cut, mm-hmm. which had been called Brandy, by the way. Mm-hmm. On the sheet music, it still said Brandy, because at the original writers, that was the title. But Clive had found this tune for Barry to do, Clive Davis. We packed up our stuff. The whole band was gone. I think there were two or three guitar players and a couple of key, you know, another keyboard player and a percussionist and a drummer, Jimmy Young and myself. And uh, Barry said, okay, everybody wait, wait out in the hall. While Clive comes and approves this version of the song we just cut, but you know, don't don't pack up quickly. Pack up slowly, you know, because he didn't know if he wanted us to stay or what Clive was going to say. And Clive said, "I want to." Took a listen and he sat there listening very carefully and intently to our our, our version that we thought was pretty cool of Mandy. Mm-hmm. And at the end of it, the tape stopped and he said, "I think I heard this more like a bridge over troubled water mm-hmm. kind of tune." So Barry let everybody go except the drummer and I. Jimmy Young and myself, mm-hmm. and we cut it as, as a trio. You know, and it was very slow. I remember all my life. You know, and it ended up being like his first big number one hit. You know, you've an inspiration, uh, you and, and all the, you know, Max, um, uh, Paul, all you guys are, uh, are doing something every night in front of millions of people. Y'all are probably the most visible musicians. In the world. Well, it's great that there's an audience for what we do, you know, because we'd be playing anyway. There just happens to be a camera on us. That's the big difference. 